Welcome back. Now that we've talked about viruses and variants, it's time to talk about vaccines. Now, there's no shortage of discussions on the history of vaccines on YouTube. Also, at the time of the creation of this video, there's also several videos on the specifics, specifics of the COVID-19 vaccine. What I want to do is talk about vaccines with the assumption that you're following the structure of this course as laid out in the syllabus. So, assuming you've watched all the videos assigned prior to this, let's get started. Again, as I've said repeatedly, this is a survey course that is specifically designed to familiarize you with the science and math of COVID-19. So, instead of going all the way back to the 17 and 1800s to talk about the discovery of vaccines, I want to dive straight into the COVID-19 vaccine. Of course, I'll cover some basics about vaccines in general, but I want to get to the stuff that you signed up for. The innovation of the COVID-19 vaccine is the way that it is introduced to the immune system. In our viruses video, we discussed how SARS-CoV-2 enters human cells. So you're absolutely prepared for this discussion. Many of the vaccines we are used, uh, I'm sorry, many of the vaccines that we're used to are so-called attenuated or killed vaccines. And in other words, they contain a modified or extremely weakened virus. What's different about the COVID-19 vaccine is that it's introduced as messenger RNA or mRNA. So can you remember what mRNA is? Again, just a quick review. mRNA contains genetic information that will be translated into a string of specific amino acids called, what is it? A polypeptide. That polypeptide will fold in a very specific way to become a functional protein. If you don't remember that, I suggest you uh, go back and take a look at the uh, um, Central Dogma video and the viruses video and the variants video. Now, You'll recall in our viruses video, I described the four structural proteins of SARS-CoV-2. Can you remember those? There's the E protein or the envelope protein, the M or membrane protein, the N or nucleocapsid protein, and then finally, what's the big one? That's right, the spike protein or the S protein. Now, the developers of the COVID-19 vaccine specifically targeted the spike protein. Because we know the genome of SARS-CoV-2, we know the specific amino acids and the order of those amino acids. That also means that we know what the mRNA sequence is for the spike protein. The COVID-19 vaccine codes for the spike protein on the SARS-CoV-2 virus, not the entire virus. Okay, let me, let me repeat that again. The COVID-19 vaccine codes just for the spike protein, that spike protein that exists on the virus. The vaccine does not code for the entire virus. So the vaccine is not an attenuated or killed virus at all. It's merely the part of the virus that attaches to the human ACE2 receptor. And that part is specifically the S protein. Remember that? To be clear, the vaccine does not contain the sequence for the entire virus, just the spike protein. So why would researchers do that? So once the cell takes up the mRNA that's introduced by the vaccine, the cell will begin translating that vaccine, uh, vaccine mRNA into that specific string of amino acids we've been talking about that string of amino acids will be a polypeptide that looks just like the spike protein that the virus makes using our machinery. As a result, it will be folded into a functional spike protein with a big difference, big capital B-I-G difference. And that big difference is uh, from the, that it doesn't include the rest of the virus. So it will fold into the functional spike protein with the big difference from the spike protein made by the virus. The, the, the E protein will be missing, the M protein will be missing, the N protein will be missing, 
the the polymerases that are uh, created by the, the virus, none of that will be there. In other words, no virus, just the spike protein. Those spike proteins will be packaged by the vaccine recipient's cells and then transported out of the cell. The immune system will then recognize those proteins as foreign. Remember that? Even though they were made in our own cells, they'll recognize those spike proteins as foreign and attack them. Remember though, our immune system is attacking a harmless protein. Again, no virus there, just the protein. Without the rest of the genetic code, it's just a benign S protein hanging out in our body. So, so how does this work? As you know from our immunology introduction video, the adaptive immune system will become primed with the introduction of the spike protein. The B lymphocytes will create antibodies that will recognize and bind those non-self proteins that we will in fact be making ourselves. And the B memory cells will take notes so that they can be ready for secondary exposures in the future. Um, the vaccine will be given in two doses to provide sufficient protection. After the first vaccine dose, it'll take a couple of weeks for the B cells, or if you recall, the plasma cells, to produce, the, to produce and release the antibodies. And even once those antibodies are created, their concentration starts to decrease fairly quickly. That's why the second shot is needed. Um, remember those T memory cells and the B memory cells that we talked about in the immune uh, videos? Well, when the immune system is exposed to a foreign invader a second time, the T memory cells and the B memory cells consult their notes. They, they check their notes. And they realize, ah, we've seen this invader before. And having received that priming dose from the vaccine, the response to the second exposure from the immune system is rapid and robust. So you should expect side effects to the, uh, to the vaccine, but the reasons why you have side effects are a little unclear. You may have heard things like, you're getting the virus and the vaccine, which is why you get sick, or something along those lines. That is categorically incorrect. The reason people develop fever, muscle aches, headaches, etc., is likely due to an initial response by the innate immune system. Anything in the, entering the body is going to be recognized as foreign by granulocytes and monocytes. However, given that B cells will not begin to produce antibodies for up to 10 days, it's unlikely that the vaccine recipient is actually feeling the effects of a mounting adaptive immune response with, within mere hours of receiving the first shot. Now, this could be ex expected for the second shot. So there is some evidence that the side effects could be due to the lipid nanoparticles that are used to protect the mRNA in the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines. Now, we haven't talked a lot about this, but RNA is fragile, and we'll come back to that in a second. But the reason we know that there's some evidence that the side effects could be due to these lipid nanoparticles is that researchers administered non-mRNA containing nanoparticles to control animals. So they gave some animals the vaccine as, as we got it, which were nanoparticles that contained the mRNA inside, and they gave some animals, these control animals, a, uh, a shot of nanoparticles that don't actually have the mRNA in them. The animals experienced the exact same side effects as those who received the mRNA containing nanoparticles. So, why do we need the uh, why do we need the symptom causing lipid nanoparticle? Right, I'm looking for a good way to say that. Um, good question. These are needed because all forms of RNA are fragile, right? So these lipid nanoparticles are causing some symptoms, right? Potentially, or at least some some literature, uh, some research suggests that. Why do we need them at all? Well. They're there to protect the RNA. Um, RNA is extremely fragile. In fact, uh, that's a big reason why the vaccine has to be stored at such cold temperatures. Um, the cold helps to protect the mRNA because it's unstable, unstable and fragile. For storage and shipment, the lipid nanoparticles help the mRNA for delivery into the body's cells. So you've got to keep the mRNA um, super, super cold so that it, uh, it doesn't degrade. 
So let's let's get back to this. In summary, this is a really exciting and innovative vaccine that's expected to be quite effective. Now again, you will not be given a killed or attenuated ver uh, version of the virus, but rather a building block that will allow your cells to make the outermost portion of that virus, which is the spike protein, that your body will recognize as foreign and prime your immune system. Now, you'll probably feel pretty crummy after getting the vaccine, but that's not because of anything having to do with the virus itself, but rather probably the delivery vehicle. But again, we don't fully understand why uh, some people uh, are experiencing side effects and some more than others and so on and so forth. So, um, so the, the jury is still a little bit out on that. But now, what about the vaccine that was developed that only required one immunization? What's, what's different about that vaccine? Well, Johnson & Johnson, as well as AstraZeneca, developed what are called adenovirus vaccines or adenovirus vaccines. You know, it's tomato, tomato, right? They're also sometimes called vector vaccines. Uh, adenovirus vaccines are engineered so that they cannot cause disease or replicate themselves, but they can deliver or vector a string of nucleotides to the nucleus of a cell. Adenoviruses are double-stranded DNA viruses. So to create the COVID-19 adenovirus vaccine, scientists had to cut part of the virus's DNA and splice in the DNA sequence for the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. After the patient is given the injection, the viral vector vaccine will then deliver that engineered DNA that includes, again, the DNA sequence for the spike protein into the muscle. The muscle cells will take up that engineered adenovirus but not cause disease or replicate, remember, because it's engineered not to do that. The spike protein DNA that's delivered by the adenovirus will then be transcribed into mRNA and it will leave the cell to be translated into the S protein. In fact, once the mRNA leaves the cell, the process between the two types of vaccines is basically the same. The advantages to the adenovir uh, adenovirus vaccine is that it's DNA, which means that it's more stable and only requires a refrigerator temperature instead of ultra-cold storage, which means more people have access to this vaccine. Okay, so we've covered a lot about uh, vaccines, but what about that one question that we had, why do variants matter? So here's Here's why variants matter. It's possible that at some point, the genetic sequence for the spike protein can mutate and look different. If it looks different enough, it's possible that our vaccines that have been developed won't recognize that spike protein anymore. In other words, we've created a spike protein for the wild type, not for the variant. Now, most of these variants now have a few changes or mutations in the spike protein, but not enough mutations to make it look different. And so our immune cells are still primed for the spike protein, the wild type spike protein that still looks close enough to the variant protein. The reason we're, we're following these variants is because we have to know at what point, hopefully never, the spike protein will look different and not be recognized by our immune system. That's why variants matter. Okay? All right, so we've now covered viruses, variants, and vaccines. I will see you in the next video.